Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hi. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I've got Rox back here with me. Yay. So hello. Um, let me know about the volume, first of all. Rox, say hello so people can hear you talk, so we can double check, make sure we're not having. Some all right. Issues. Hello from Minneapolis. What's the weather? The world. There? Today, I had to close my windows for this. It's so it couldn't be more perfect. Uh, very nice and dry and 77 degrees. Here, Beautiful. Today it is, right now it's 99. It's only supposed to be 105 today. Tomorrow it's supposed <laughs> to be 109. And we still have the smoky air. We have uh, bad air from the fires in California still. So everybody, uh, Ruth says that the volume is fine. Sound is good. Okay, so we'll carry on then, yay. I had Rox on here a couple months ago, and we both had so much fun. Prior to that, we'd only met in person one time, but we are very familiar with each other through the Master Hand Knitting Program and have uh, corresponded back and forth through Ravelry um, and such. And you all know that she has wonderful, wonderful, wonderful YouTube videos that she puts up twice a week. And we were just talking a few minutes ago when we're getting ready that both of us are very, very good at technical knitting. We both really enjoy the technical aspects of knitting and the history and all that came before and all that. But we're completely different personality wise. And um, you'll see that because what, today what we're going to do is we're going to share how do we make YouTube videos. We're going to share how she does it and how I do it. And um, we've never shared with each other before how we do it. So this is a no. first. And it was very, it's really fun to see the differences in our personality in our setups. Our output is very similar. You know, we both do, I think, very good quality videos. But how we get to that point is very, very different. So yeah. welcome back, Rox. Sorry. I said, welcome back. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It's great to be here. I'm excited. It's uh, it's a lot of fun to, to see your setup and uh, <laughs> versus mine. <laughs> I'm a little envious of yours, actually, now that I see uh, the difference. But <laughs> Well, I'm envious of yours. So let's start back at the beginning. What made you think to make a YouTube video to start out with? The very first video you made, what led up to you making that video? Um, the first videos, well, I joined YouTube not to do knitting videos. I joined YouTube because I had a daughter in figure skating and all of our relatives were out of town or out of state. And so I was sharing videos and then I started sharing knitting related videos. Like if I went to a knitting event, I might post that. Um, but between two, I think it was 2009, between 2009 and 2012 is when I kind of did my had my first sort of wave of videos and part of that was I started teaching at my local yarn shop and so I created some little reference videos um, for my students like if I was teaching a raglan sweater and they were going to have to divide for the sleeves in the middle of the week um, I knew they wouldn't remember when they got back and so I created those and then I had a column that I wrote on Ravelry. They had a newsletter called This Week in Ravelry, and I had a, a weekly, or however often it was published, a column. And so I would do a lot of up close uh, photos, but I sometimes would do videos for that. And at the same time, I was trying to explore how to, we didn't call it podcasting at that point. They were calling it vlogging. And so there were some people who were doing vlogs and that I thought was interesting. And I was trying to figure out how, how could I do that with knitting? And I tried a few things and the setup that I had was not ideal for that. And I, it, that just didn't work out well. So it was, I probably did like 30 videos in that, that three year time period. And then for the next five years, I might have put one video a year or every two years. And in my mind, I thought, 
if I was going to post a video just on my own, it was going to be because it was something really unusual or different. So I thought, well, everybody's putting out videos on how to cast on or do this or that. What would be the point of me doing that? And not realizing that everybody has their own take on it and whatever. But this was also kind of early years of YouTube. So, um, so I just kind of did it really sporadically, and it, and and that was that was how I got started with it. So, so let me tell was, how I got started, and then we'll kind of go back and forth. Yeah. Okay. So I got started. The very first, I had no intention of making YouTube videos. I didn't even watch YouTube. I didn't. YouTube was nothing in my life. And but I wrote an article for Cast On Magazine about brioche knitting. And I want, and in that article, I discussed the Italian cast on, and I found it extraordinarily difficult to describe it with words only, yeah, so that someone could actually do it. So I thought I asked Dorinda. I said, "Can I make a video to go with this?" And I think I'm actually the first person that made a video to go with an article that was in mm -hmm. cast on magazine. And she said, "Sure." So I made a video that shows the Italian cast on for double knitting when I mean, you can use it for brioche or whatever, but it was specific mm -hmm. for that article. It was for double knitting. And I didn't make another video for a long time also because it was a one time deal, you know? And, yeah. Uh, but then I don't really n remember. I think that, I think that when I really got into making a lot of videos was when I started teaching locally. Like you mm -hmm. at the at our junior college, I st I taught knitting classes at the junior college, and um, I made the videos for the students to go along with the lessons, so that I told them, you know, you're not going to remember everything I tell you in class today, so I've made a video for you, you know, yeah, so that, and it's exactly as I taught it in class, so you you won't, you know. And, yeah. and it was skills that other people have taught over and over and over, but I wanted them to see it the way I taught it because that's yep. what I did in class. Right. And that's when I first started getting a really pretty positive response on YouTube, realizing other people like to watch them too, because I'd initially made them just for my students. So I'm going to tell first how I did my first setup, and then we'll go to you and we'll go back and forth like that. Okay. Okay. So when I first um, started making YouTube videos, I made them very similar how I make them now as far as filming. And I used a room in my house that I had to, was where my desk was. And my desktop was black. Uh, so I just used the desktop as the background. I think that very first video, I used a manila folder as the background. Um, yeah, I used a manila folder. <laughs> and I use a C clamp, a double ended C clamp. This is it. And I had this for some other purpose, but I figured out I could clamp it to my desk at one end and clamp my phone to it at the other end. Ah. And I put my phone between my eyes and my hands and literally watched myself knit through my phone and filmed it. And this way I do, it's exactly how I still do it. But I, my setup is different. So my phone is here and I'm knitting and I can reach up and change and focus just like this. What year did you start doing that? Like, because I'm thinking about what my phone was like back then, and I don't think it was I could one have of the original that. iPhones. I had the very first iPhone, but I don't remember what year it was. But I'd have to go to my YouTube channel and look. But I've, yeah. I've never used anything but my phone. I've never oh, used okay. a camera because I don't even own a camera. I just have my okay. Phone. Um, so this, so I'm literally looking. The phone is between my eyeballs and my knitting. So that's why my videos look like you're looking directly at your hands because it is in the line of sight between my eyes and my knitting. And um, whoops, I went out of focus because I've been over. Let me get back in focus here. Um, so I used my desktop. I used that manila folder and then I used my desktop with the black surface. I did not have any special lighting, so I could only make videos when the lighting was good at that window and it couldn't be too bright 
or not bright enough. And in order to diffuse it, I hung a white pillowcase over my window to diffuse the light. So I could only make videos at a very specific time of the day. And nine times out of 10, something else was happening. Like I had some new windows put in my house. Of course, that's when the workers are there going bang, 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 you yeah. know. And uh, so I couldn't record at that time. So, um, and I did that for quite some time. I just moved to my library. I don't know why I'm fuzzy because I was going bang, bang, bang. I moved to this room uh, recently. So that was how I started doing videos. So Rox, what was your setup in the beginning? In the beginning when I filmed videos, uh, it was usually in our kitchen. So I live in Minnesota, which is pretty far north, which means in the winter time, there are very few daylight hours. And our kitchen has southern facing, so there at least you could get some light in there. So I would, um, I don't think I had a phone. I didn't have an iPhone for a number of years. I think I didn't get one till later. So I probably had some other kind of uh, phone, but we had kids. And so we had um, like a pocket sized digital camera and it was a pretty good one. So, and we had tripods cause my husband has been interested in photography and video and audio and all that since he was young. So we had a tripod. So I would hook up the tripod on the camera and I would basically do what you were doing. I would have the camera in between me and my knitting, but I it was on a tripod, which meant I was straddling the tripod and reaching way around in front. So I was knitting in a very kind of unnatural position. And the, the problem was that I hadn't, I don't think I'd quite transferred over to continental knitting totally. And my English style is with long needles that are anchored. So it could be a real challenge um, to do that. Sometimes I would do them up in this office I have now. This became my knitting room at some point. But um, usually I was I was straddling around this tripod in those uh, early years. And I was using uh, free the free editing software that was on my Windows PC. Then it would crash and it was very frustrating. So, and things were really limited then too, in terms of the resolution of the images and also like the file, like the, how many minutes long the video could be, that was limited. And then you were limited by, you know, your upload speed, all of that stuff. It was, uh, you know, so my, those early videos are, are like four or five minutes long because they tend to be a very simple technique or concept, but also I was just limited by, by how YouTube, big are you? By YouTube, limited by YouTube, because the same yeah. with me. And and so I had no editing software whatsoever, none. And what I would do is if I had a blooper, I would just start over. Or if somebody walked in the room or my dogs barked or whatever, you know, I would just start over until I could go all the way through it without making a mistake. And um, so sometimes it would take, and some days you're just off. Some days the right words will not come out of your mouth. You say left instead of right and knit instead of pearl. And you don't realize you're saying it till you watch the video, the replay, and you go, oh my God, you know. I or you say it. yarn instead of needle or. <laughs> yes, and you, and when, but when you're saying it, it makes perfect sense. But when you watch the replay, you're going, uh oh. And so I would have to um, start all over again. And then YouTube, like Rox was saying, they had a maximum amount that you could upload. I think it was 15, 12 minutes. Something like that. Yeah. It was short. So until you become known to them or whatever. Yeah. They had some kind of limit for subscribers yeah. or view counts or, you know, something right. like that. And, um, you know, so, and then on top of that, okay, so we start out being knitters, right? They just want to share with people that's all we want to do is share yeah. and uh, but then you got to learn all you have to learn youtube the back side of youtube and about you know i didn't know anything about putting tags on or or uh you know any of that stuff so i just made my videos i'm just merrily going along you know and then people would ask me well do you do this and you do that no 
I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I know. And then the whole thing with the, then they came out with thumbnails because it used to be you didn't have thumbnails and like, oh, you're never going to get any views if you don't have thumbnails. And let me tell you, I have a couple of videos that have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views and they continue to get them. And um, there is no thumbnail. <laughs> right, right. And then, or they, they uh, want you to um, um, have end screens and have uh, sharing your videos, you know, adding, what do they call that where you add your other videos in, in the corner? It's like oh, the end mine. screens. Yeah, the end, end, screens. end screens and the, uh, so, you in know. The car. And then, and then, this is bringing forward, we'll go back still some more, but recently, YouTube, you know, they make these changes and they just apply it to you and all of your videos. Like yeah. they decided they need to have mid roll advertisements. Oh my God. I have like almost 400 videos on my main YouTube channel. And now, you know, and I really don't like mid screen ads, mid roll. Yeah. So I have to go back and edit them because they went back and applied them to all of your previous videos that were over a certain length of time. I happened to see somebody tweet about that a few weeks ahead of time. And even though I had opted out of mid-roll videos, uh, mid-roll ads before that, if you, if you did something in your, in your uh, analytics thing uh, before a particular date, you could then make sure they weren't going to add mid-roll ads. And, but I wouldn't have known to do that if I hadn't seen somebody oh, tweet know about it. So I have, you know, and so I'm just slowly, slowly doing that, you know, and it's a, um, it's a process. It's really an annoying process, really annoying. And YouTube, it's it, and and then like um, on my live stream interviews like this, you know, the chat should be recorded and um, show replay back. And on most of them, it does, but a couple of them, it doesn't. And why? I don't know. I don't know why, you know, and someone will say, I can't see the chat as if it's my fault. They can't. Yeah. See the chat. <laughs> I have no control over that, you know? Um, so anyway, the next thing, so you talked about your beginning. The next thing I decided that I wanted to actually invest some of my time in my channel, you know, start marketing, not paying ads and stuff, but actually, thinking about what I was going to do and have a plan because before that it was just haphazard. It was just whatever I felt like doing pretty much yeah. whatever I feel like doing too, but I have a bigger plan. And that is when I started my Facebook group and my Ravelry group. And I really didn't want to do that, but people would ask me, Suzanne, you should start a group. You should start a group. And so I finally did. And I'm glad I did. I'm really, really glad I did, but it does create more responsibility and yep. it makes me feel um, like if I take time off, then I'm responsible to let people know why I'm taking some time off, you know, that I'm taking, I'm going to take a break. I need a break, you know, um, yeah. so I have to say I'm taking a break from it for a while. And there are times when you feel like going gung ho, you know, and every, and it's exciting and you've got a list of things you want to do. I have a spreadsheet of all the videos that I want to make and I put them in an order, you know, just a, a to-do list. But there are other times when I don't really feel like doing it, <laughs> you know. Yep. <laughs> but uh, yep. so anyway, so I moved when I was saying, okay, I'm going to actually focus on this. We redid the room that I'm in right now and I'm going to show you the room. This is a green screen right here. I'm going to drop my green screen. So I moved into this room. Look Are at you me. sure? <laughs> I'm invisible. It's so, funny. Um, there you go. This is my library. And the window here is facing the north. So I get really, really good lighting. I do have lighting now, which you can see. These, these glasses don't have an anti-reflective coating. And I'll show you that lighting in a bit. We'll do that. But I can turn the lighting off and on with my phone. So I'm going to turn it off. So that this is with no extra lighting. And now the reflection you're seeing in my glass is actually the window that's in front of me. So I do like the lighting. I like the lighting. Um, and they're placed up 
high, so they're not directly on my face. So let me take my green screen. And so I, I didn't get a green screen till this year, but I did move to this room and I still didn't have any lighting, but I'm getting the northern light. And so about that time, I decided to make myself a light box. And so I'm going to show you my light box. It's really sophisticated. <laughs> this is my light box. That's the top. That's one side. That's interfacing. That fabric is interfacing. And this is just poster board. This is the top and this is the cutout. This is where I put my, my clamp for my phone holds it right here. That's about the vision. And so I use this with two very rustic lights, which I'll show you. Let me show you a picture of it. That was my next step. Okay. So let me share you. Let me get my, when did you start? When did you decide to do that? Would you know what year that was? Um, I don't, I've been using it for so not very long ago. It's probably three years ago. Cause that's when I made my groups it was three years ago, maybe two years ago. It was this time of year. Okay. Three years ago, two years ago or three years ago, time flies. So I'm going to share with you, um, how I use that light box. This is the light box sitting on my desk and I am sitting right here in front of this desk at this moment. Here is my computer that I'm looking into right now. So this is my clamp with my phone and I'll show you the, this is my, um, can you see the little speaker on my phone? I'll the show. microphone? Yeah. That little ball ball that's sitting on my phone. I'll show that to you. Yeah. And then see the light bulb, the light to the right of the shadow box. Uh -huh. Another light over to the left. Those are just, you know, Home Depot clamp on lights with LED lights in them. And then I have another one that shines down from the top. So that is my very, very sophisticated light box. And I'll show you the, um, I use this as my speaker. It's made by Sure. This comes off. It just keeps, you know, breath noise, it mm -hmm. breath noise. It's directional. You can move it around, but it plugs right into my phone like this. So that's another thing. You got to make sure your phone's charged up, you know, yep. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just a little detail, but I have had it go dead in the middle of making a video because I didn't charge it up. So we'll go to the next step with rocks. How did, how did you evolve? And do you want to go um, to your pictures or not? Do I want to what? Go to your pictures or not? Um, um, yeah, why don't you go? I think I numbered them and I wrote That's down them order. on the piece of order so I know what I'm uh, talking about. So um, the first one is my light box. <laughs> it's This is from overhead. So when I'm doing my technique videos, I have a, uh, a table, like one of those little buffet tables that you get at Costco, and it can go up and down different levels because I need it at a kind of a lower level than I'd want a regular table. And I experimented with different surfaces, but I've always gone with a light gray. Um, and this right here is pull up couple of yards of polar fleece on top of that table. And then you see I have uh, a tripod set up that has um, the, a camera directly overhead, but because of the way it plugs into the, into the tripod, I can't see what I'm doing. So I have a little monitor strapped to that, um, that uh, tripod. It's more like a, a unipod or I don't know what it's called. It might be a microphone stand for all I know, but I have to have the monitor strapped upside down in order for me to see what I'm doing. So I am often looking at the monitor while I'm knitting to make sure I'm, I'm in frame. And then I can just reach right above my head and zoom in or, um, or zoom out if I need to on the left. Um, you can just see there's kind of, um, 
there's, I can't remember the name of this kind of a, a barn door or something kind of a lighting thing my husband bought for me because he loves the whole lighting and video or audio type of stuff. So he set that up for me. And on the right hand side, I think I just have like a shop light or something so that and then overhead in the basement ceiling. I live in the Midwest, so everybody has like an unfinished basement in their house. That's why it's concrete floors. Um, but right above my head is an LED light shop. So I have light from above and light from the sides. And um, and in addition, I have um, some microphone, <clears throat> this kind of, um, I use a mic system that um, you'll see in a, in a later um, picture. So uh, if you wanna do the next picture, so this is when I'm doing my technique videos, I have at the very beginning of the video and the very end of the video, um, I will have what I call face to the camera and I'm standing in front of that bookcase there. And in this, um, uh, off to the right, there's a black stand that's holding like an LED um, spotlight type of <clears throat> thing. This, um, the tripod in the, in the, foreground that has you see that black cloth um, that I have that raised up really high and the camera is mounted underneath there and that's actually a, a teleprompter um, if you go to the next picture so you can see from the other direction I have a, an iPad sitting on this um, flat stand and it gets reflected on this glass that's in front of the camera lens and then I can read what I'm going to say because I what I used to do is write it up on pieces of paper and then stand there and try to remember what I was going to say and then I would forget what I was going to say and I was standing there I, I it was like I could see myself thinking like trying to remember what I was going to say and so I got this it was very inexpensive um, this little teleprompter system I just use an app on a very very old iPad um, it's the only thing I use the iPad for is a hand-me-down iPad. Um, and then on that little table, that's what's called this uh, roadcaster. That's what I have my um, microphone receiver plugged into. And then in, on the front of the table, there's a little black um, microphone transmitter that I clip to my belt. And then there's a wire that with the lavalier mic that I uh, usually put up here um, on my shirt. And so that rec that lets me check my sound levels and <clears throat> and I record my sound. So I'm recording sound both on the camera and on this roadcaster. And then when I am editing, I synchronize them and I remove the camera um, audio. When I'm doing the technique overhead stuff, my my uh, face is close enough to the camera that it the sound is okay. But when the camera is several feet away from me in my office with all those hard surfaces, it, it gets kind of echoey. And so this way I can just kind of maintain the same level of sound through the entire video. So then also you'll see there's like this cube that has a light in it. Again, there's just another shop light in there and that's kind of a soft box. It's um, sort of like the same thing that Suzanne made in order to do her videos, only it's meant for like taking photos inside of, only I just put it around that light to, to give me some more light. Um, so that's this, and then you can see on the little desk, I have another monitor there so that I can tell if I'm in frame. A lot of times, if I get my, um, uh, if I don't have my tripod up high enough, I can, you know, I might be cutting off my head so I can kind of tell how that's framed. And now, so- down and put it up every time sorry or you take this setup down and put it up every time or do you just leave it in position like this oh oh i can't leave it in position um i the table stays there all the time i have a video a, a picture at the end that you'll see how i'll show you what it looks like when everything's set up if you go to the next um the next picture i think is just an up uh close Oh, that's the teleprompter. So you can see the the iPad is sitting flat, but it gets reflected up, and you, and you can't see that in the video. I just can read it, you know, directly off of there. So um, we go to the next picture. So this is that that uh, thing that's recording my sound here. It's meant for doing podcasting, and you could have several people calling in and doing a recording, all that, and have sound effects. It's way overkill for what I needed. Um, but there wasn't anything that was that I didn't need that was 
better, especially when you have a husband who's an audio freak. So that was the thing I got. So then um, when I'm doing my casual Friday podcasts, I have, I don't have the teleprompter. I have the tripod in the same place. You can go to the next picture. Um, and, but I have a chair and I'm seated. So instead of standing in front of it, like I do when I'm doing my technique videos, I'm seated. Um, and then, um, I've got one more picture. The next one. Um, oh, oh, I thought I had one other one before that. This is, so this red carpet right here there that's my live stream setup so this is what i'm facing right now that's my computer and there's a, a little looks like a lamp arm clamped to the desk that's holding a logitech camera so that i can do i can switch between face to the camera in a live stream and if somebody asks me a question i want to demonstrate it then i could switch to that camera and i uh, have that little like puzzle piece blocking pad there as the background because my desk is red and shiny. And so that that helps for that. So then, and you can see I've moved the light box uh, to be right next to my desk to help fill in uh, with light. It's, I have that to my right right now. And um, to the left, I have my regular ot light that I use when I knit, but I, you, I turn it so that it, light is shining at me um, when I'm filming. So then that last photo, the very last photo. This one? This one. So that, nope, that one. So that red carpet is five feet by eight feet. So that's the entire floor space uh, that I have for walking around in my office. So, so that I can't leave that tripod, my chair, my desk chair is pushed in there and there's no, there's no way I could have the tripod set up. So I have to take the light stand and the tripod down every time I usually fold up the chair and put it out in the hallway because I can't get at my shelves otherwise, otherwise. So, um, but I do leave that table there just because it's heavy and it would be a pain to get it and set up in the right spot every time. So, so you can see my, my setup is way more elaborate than yours. And yet my videos aren't really. It's, it's, well, that's what's so fun is to compare because it's our personalities. It's just how you do things, you know, and how I do things. It's whatever it is that appeals to you and the tools that you use. You know what I mean? Well, and also the sp uh, spouse, like my, I, I said, my husband has been an audio and video and photography person. So he had a lot of like the light stands and all that kind the micro, the original microphone I used, he had that. Um, and so he would, when I started doing weekly technique videos, I started in February of 2017. So I decided I was going to do that at the end of 2016 because the yarn shop I taught uh, close. She, she retired. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And so we spent January kind of figuring out my first setup and how, cause I said, I can't straddle the tripod. And, but by then there were YouTube videos on how to shoot overhead video, which there wasn't when I originally did this. And so that's how I got the idea of the overhead upside down that you could then flip in your editing software that had never occurred to me. So, cause I kept trying to figure how could I do it over my shoulder or how could I, how could I do it? And I did like, I didn't have an, um, an iPhone. And when I did have an iPhone, it didn't have enough room. I mean, I, cause I never had in mind, I need an iPhone to do video. So I always got the kind of the lowest end I, iPhone. Um, so I, let me see. A couple of years ago, I bought, uh, six years ago, I bought this this camera right here. And they actually still make this. They have different models. It's a Sony RX100 and then two Roman numerals, Roman numeral two. Um, they still make this model, but they have many other um, more models. So it, I, I really, it, it does macro photography really well. So I, I really like it and it's simple. So it just, I have it set up and, you know, I, I know, I know what, you know, where the dial is to make things go, you know, closer or further away and what button to push from behind to get, turn it into a movie. Um, 
So the downside of this is there's a 20 minute limit or 22 minutes and then it will stop recording. So I had to learn like with my podcasts, um, I used to just look, watch and wait for the 20 minutes. And now I'm like, oh, I have these different sections. I'm going to record each section separately because I'm going to be putting a title screen in there anyway. And then it really helps me also kind of keep track of how how much time I'm talking. And I kind of know how much is going to get edited out. And I, and sometimes I'll go, oh, I don't need to do this other section. That's that's more than I really want to, to do this week. Because every minute you have a video, that's at least two minutes of editing time. And then so processing the, and then yeah. uploading. You know, and sometimes YouTube does not cooperate. You know, you'll be uploading a video. You can upload a video, 15 minute video, and you know, it uploads and everything's fine. That might take, for me, it might take from a half an hour to an hour for it to upload where I can start editing it on YouTube. But then there's other times when it like it gets stuck in the middle, uh. half uploaded and it just sits there forever and ever and ever. And then I don't know, should I upload it again? You know, or is it going to be- are you, are you uploading it? Because you use Final Cut Pro, right? Right. I so we both, that's the one thing that we're both alike. We both use the same editing software. I used to, to export from Final Cut Pro directly to YouTube. So it was doing what they call transcoding and uploading, and it would could take a couple of hours. And we finally, luckily, I have this husband who's he's tech technology guy, and we figured out how to export the video onto my local drive, which was much faster. And then I knew that it was the way it was correct. And, and then, then you, I you could also use Final Cut Pro again, because while it's uploading, you can't use Final Cut Pro if you're uploading from Final Cut right, Pro. Right, right, right. So, uh, you know, two so I export it and then I upload it and the uploading just takes a couple minutes. Okay, well, I'll have to try. That's good to know. So let me show, go back to um, what I do again. So let me check, get rocks out of the picture and put me in here. And I'll show the software that I'm using now too to do all that. So this is my setup. So I had that box on here on my desk before, which was my light box. This is my desk without the light box. And you can see those two lamps, one on either side. Those are by, made by Elgato. And that was my big expenditure this year. I got those two lamps in March and I bought my green screen in March. And I also bought new software but before i talk about this software which is the ecamm live i'm going to share with you the software that um let me get it on here that we use for editing and this is my most recent video that's on here so you can see that this is called final cut pro now final cut pro Rox and i both have macs believe it or not so you know, that was another thing we have in common. And we both use this software. Prior to this software, we used software that was called iMovie before Final Cut Pro came out. Well, I used, I used, because um, I had a Windows machine, I used Windows Movie Maker or yeah. something. And I used iMovie because I've had a Mac for a long time. So, um, but this is called Final Cut Pro. And in this, um, I can move, you know, let's see if it'll let me do this. See, so you can edit your video. You can edit the sound and the picture. You can create your thumbnails on here or the preload, which is what I use for my thumbnail as well. You can adjust the color, the size, you know, you can cut and paste. So um, this is cool, but again, it's a learning curve. It all, all these things we're talking about, Every single one of them has a learning curve. So not only do we have to you keep our knowledge good about knitting, which I work on constantly, and I'm sure Rox does too, yeah. but we're trying to learn how can we share it? What is the best way for us to share it? Which also has learning curves. So um, I never edited my videos for a long time. And if they weren't good, I just started over again. When I learned how to start editing them, editing them 
that was like a game changer for me because then I knew if I have a blooper, I can just keep going and I can cut the blooper out. And that was like so awesome to be able to do that. Um, you don't realize also how many verbal sort of disfluencies you have until you listen to yourself and the verbal tics that, that you have as well. The, um, so, you know, it just, it, what, cause it's you thinking out loud and, and to try to get it to change those habits is really hard. It's like trying to knit a different way, you know, because once you get into creating your video, you fall back into your comfort zone, into your knowledge area. And it just comes out of your mouth. I don't, I don't re, I don't write down what I'm going to say in advance. It just comes out of my mouth. So uh, yeah. it's, and sometimes strange things come out. <laughs> yeah. I don't think, that, I don't, some people do these um, like voiceovers later, which I have never figured out the timing, like how people can time that. Like the only, I had use that teleprompter when I'm introducing a technical video and then, and then finishing it. But I don't use that for anything else. And I, you know, I try to have an outline for what I'm going to say to make sure that I, I stay to the talking points. But because I'm me and I can talk forever, my video, you know, the, I, my technique videos, even if I think I'm, oh, I went right through, through the whole thing, I'm going to cut out half of it. Cause I'm like, that is not, <laughs> I, I do not need to say that, but I had to say that I had to say it, but it, nobody else needs to hear it. Right. Right. But, it, it was in the process, your thinking process and the flow yeah. that you were into. Exactly. Exactly. Also, you were talking about, you know, what you use for your surface. And I wanted to mention that too is, I started out with the black desktop and then you've got to think about what color yarn and is it too bright? Does it reflect the light? Like, like white yarn in the black backdrop, you can see the stitch, but it's pretty bright, you know, yeah. and you want to be able to see the stitch detail and you want your camera to be able to focus on it. Um, so I tried, I've through the years, I've used a variety of backdrops and colors of yarn. I'm constantly working on the lighting, the, the mat that I use underneath my work and my yarn choices. Yeah. Uh, and I used to use years ago, Plymouth um, had a, a yarn that was um, kind of variegated and they had a few different colorways and they had one that was like yellow and orange and blue and green. It was like, but middle mid range colors. And I loved that yarn for doing demonstrations because you could say the pink, like if you needed to refer to a stitch below, you could say the yellow stitch. Right. You know, so, and you, so it was clear which one that you were talking about and they discontinued it. So when I started in 2017, I, I was just buying any kind of worsted weight wool that I could find on sale. Cause I knew I was going to be using a lot of it. And then I realized quickly, Oh, if it has acrylic in it, it's going to sh shine. If it, if it's a certain color, like I love red and I love fuchsia. They look terrible on camera. They, they're they yeah, terrible. Stitches. You can't see the stitches. So let me just reach over here one second. Um, where is it? So this is, uh, I have the bin with my, <laughs> my swatching yarn right next to me. This is the color that I tend to use the most right now. It's the medium blue color. I probably would never knit anything from it. If you had blue eyes, you'd probably love this, but I don't have blue eyes, so it's not a color I wear, but. Um, just, yeah, I, and I have a green that's a similar similar green, and I, I get kind of tired of it. I wish I could do something else, but uh, I just. It's what shows uh, up on camera. Yeah. yeah, I know it's going to work because sometimes I've used another color because maybe I was low on this or something. One of my bags of swatches full. Um, do you of keep all of them? <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, do I do I care about this? That's just and one I, bag. <laughs> I, I throw so many swatches away. It depends on the kind of swatch it is. Um, but I was cleaning off my desk today, and I'm like, oh, I don't even know what this was, what I was using this for, and I just yeah, I threw, threw them. But some them of them you can use, you know. Or to use for demonstrations again. You know? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes just, if they're sizable enough and have something interesting on them, then I will use. I'll save them. But yes, yes. 
So um, let me show you, I'm going to show you my screen again. You're going to see my whole screen this time. Um, let me see if I can do that, if it'll let me do that. Screen share. Oh, I'm in Final Cut Pro. That's why it won't do that. Where's camera? Screen share. I want to show my whole. Hmm. I may not be able to do it at the moment. I didn't practice it in advance. But I, I wanted to show you the Ecamm Live software that I use um, because it takes up, I have a 27 inch um, diagonal Mac that I use. And right now my pretty much my whole screen is using stuff. I have the Ecamm Live stuff up here, which we're, you, you're seeing, that's what you're seeing. And I also have um, the Final Cut Pro up here. Plus I can see everybody's comments which is very cool. And let's actually see if there's been any comments that people have questions. Remember, if you have a question, put it all in caps so I can find it. I'm gonna start back at the very beginning of the post and look through here. Are we frozen or is that just me seeing everything We're frozen? Not frozen? We're not frozen. Okay. We're moving. We're breathing. Okay, everybody's just saying hi and where they're from and people from all over the place. Let's see. Uh, looking for a comment. Jennifer Sanders says, we are all so fortunate to have two level, three master hand knittings well, knitters willing to teach us for free. It's not really for free. You get those ads. You either get yeah. the ads or you buy YouTube Red. And I think uh, Dolise mentioned something about YouTube Red. She asked a question whether we get anything from YouTube Red. Yes, we get a pittance. We get a pittance from YouTube Red. Well, we they, they, they claim that we get more from YouTube Red per viewer than we do from ad revenue. But I, I, I have no way of comparing that. But... And the um, thing is, the, um, not very many people use YouTube Red as far as people who watch my videos. Very few of them use YouTube Red. So I don't really get a lot of information about that. And I think it's probably the demographics. I think if your demographics are like mine, they're our age. And they haven't really, I think it's called YouTube Premium though now, isn't it? It was called YouTube Red for a while, but they don't, they don't advertise it. They, I think it's like $15 a month and you can be ad free. And then they have a few things that they, uh, videos that are only available that are like specially made or financed for YouTube Premium. Um, but um I think it's just not, it's not well known. Right, right. And so I really don't see much of it. And I would say my demographics on YouTube, probably I have like, you know, from, I have lower number in like 18, 24. Most people I would say are like between 45 and 65. That's a yeah. huge, huge percent. And it looks like there's quite a few men, but it's hard to say because I think some women use their husband's accounts to watch YouTube. So it's really hard to say whether those are men watching. I know I have a lot of men followers, but I don't think that they substantiate the numbers that I see on YouTube, especially people from uh, from other countries where they have uh, a family YouTube. You know, they have a family right. YouTube that they use, and it, the, it may be in the man's name. So it looks like a man's watching your videos, but it's really a daughter or wife or sister. Uh -huh. um, Anyway, oh, uh, LR says YouTube premium is eleven ninety nine a month. Uh, Sally Peaches says, what is the best advice you can give a frustrated beginner? I would say practice a little bit every day. Don't practice for long periods of time because that's when you get frustrated. And it takes a while for your brain and your hands to get coordinated. It takes like a few weeks your brain and hands to get coordinated and if you work too much like if you spend all Sunday afternoon you might be throwing it in the garbage can by the end of Sunday it's better to 
pick it up again then when you get frustrated put it down pick it up again the next day and work a little bit yeah i would even say set a timer like i learned to spin a few years ago and i I was so excited in one of the classes that I was taking because it was doing really well and then everything kind of just fell apart. And the teacher said, you know, there's you're, even though you, you may not feel like you're tired, your muscles are tired, they're not used to this. And before I took the classes, I was practicing with a spindle and it was so frustrating because I could not get the, I couldn't create a twisted yarn that was that was staying together. And so I was setting a, time, a timer to make myself do it for 15 minutes and not give up. And then after a few days, I got the, everything just clicked. And then I was really excited. Um, but it was just sort of that commitment to do about 15 minutes a day at the beginning. And then. Um, and stay with it because yeah. it will click. It's just like when I first learned how to spin the same thing, I couldn't get it to draft. I could yep. draft and it would twist up into my hand and then one day I just start drafting. It's like it yep. just, it's like butter. It just worked. Yeah, it was like it was it was I can remember I was sitting in this chair and I was so I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and then your body just it just feels it's right. But like I used to tell my beginning students, you know, because there there's a lot to keep track of at the beginning of knitting. You've got to handle the two needles and you have to manage the yarn and you have to remember the steps of like when where do you insert the needle and how do you and wrap there's like those four steps of each stitch and so I just you know made sure they focused on you know a certain thing and then once once they didn't have to think about those things they don't have to think about what the four steps are then you can concentrate on uh, creating stitches more efficiently or handling the needles, you know, differently, but you have to not have to think about every single thing that you're doing before you can actually it's like progress. A car. It's like driving a car, riding a bicycle, you know, in the very beginning, it seems impossible, but now you drive your car, you don't even think about it. But you can yeah. remember when you first learned how to drive, you had to think about the gas pedal, the brake, the steering wheel, and look around and make sure nobody's going to run into you or you're not going to run into them. Yeah, that's overwhelming. But pretty soon your brain and your body kick in and start working together. And sometimes you don't think at all and you are and you are on autopilot and you end up at the grocery store when you <laughs> have to go somewhere. <laughs> when I retired from working, I just knew my car was going to still go to work, but it didn't. <laughs> yeah, I really did retire in my brain, but it's all also um, somebody on here just a second ago mentioned um, the yarn. Uh, Belinda said, I think the type of yarn you use makes a big difference too. And I agree there because sometimes when you're first learning how to knit, you do not want to invest any money because you're not sure if you're going to like it. But wool yarn probably is better, and a merino yarn is really nice, and a four-ply yarn is nice, not a single-ply yarn. Um, you know, I I used to, I didn't know any of these things you know, years ago. I did I knew nothing. I If I went into a yarn store, the color attracted me. And I've had students come to me with a skein of yarn that's like lace weight, and they think they're going to make, you know, a sweater out of it. And they like yeah. the color, but they didn't look to see what size the yarn was that they didn't know to look and their eyes yeah. picking it up yet. It's training your eyes. And um, so, you know, I think that wool will give you better results as far as being able to see your stitches, a smooth, plain yarn. If it's fuzzy or has any sort of texture differences in it, it's going to be really hard for you to see what you're doing. And a lot of times, unfortunately, I know a yarn store owners that I've seen where I live, when someone comes in and they've never knit before, they'll sell them a pair of needles and a ball of foo-foo yarn. It's what I call foo-foo yarn, you know, because the yarn's so pretty, it's attractive. But really what you need is something totally like this, totally plain. Yeah. Totally plain. And so you can see what your needle is doing and how how you're making the stitches. And that so was always the, sometimes it was a tough sell on the new students because I was teaching in a yarn shop. Like you, your students would have to bring stuff with them, but mine a lot of times would show up for the first class and they wouldn't have any of their materials. And so I'd take them over to the wall of like Cascade 220 or LRA, whatever the 
standard worsted weight wool, non superwash. And I'd say, you can pick anything in these colors. Right. Oh, but I really like, you know, navy or, and like, you're not going to be able to see it. You, I know it's boring, but you're just learning to knit. So just pick a color you like. It doesn't have, to, but just, you know, it, well, can I do this? You know, I didn't want him to do anything that was um, like marled or, you know, it, it just, it's going to make them crazy if they do that. So. So here's another question. This is from Nancy Creedmore. She says, have you, oh, okay. yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of common people. So have either of you had an annoying stalker or overly loving fan? You both have my admiration and appreciation. One of the things that I really do like about YouTube is we have total control over the comments. And um, I rarely delete when I probably deleted maybe four or five in all the years I've been doing it. That wasn't a spam. I get spam. Oh, the spam, the hot the, girls, uh, you know, hot, <laughs> you, just, you can hide those and report I get them. I of those every day. So, or when I yeah. put a video out, they're the first ones. They're the yep. first yep. ones every single time. Um, but other than that, like I've had somebody on one of my interviews recently that made an extraordinarily negative comment about the interviewee and I just deleted it. I love that about YouTube. I have total control over which comments are visible. Uh, so I really, I haven't had a stalker, I don't think. I have a lot of people who watch all my videos and I love them. I love every single one of them. Um, but I don't give out my email address, so I don't really have a problem, you know, with that, you know, people contacting me unnecessarily. What about you, Rox? No, I don't, um, I don't put my email address on my YouTube channel. I don't have that, but it's pretty easy to contact me and you know, on Ravelry or, you know, uh, through, if you bought one of my patterns, you know, my email address is on there. It's not a big secret what my email address is. Um, but I don't get, I don't get that. I get the same thing. Some of the very first comments are the spammy or suspect. And so you can, you know, I hide, I can hide those. I hide them from my channel and then they report them because I was afraid if I deleted those and tried to report them that they wouldn't see it. I don't know how that works. I so I hide those, I hide those and I report them. Yeah. Um, but I haven't had, every once in a while you'll get somebody who says something really snotty and like, <laughs> what is that for? Like, why, why are you up at three o'clock in the morning yeah, writing like, horrible what, things? What do you owe them? Nothing. Do you know what I mean? Well, or just to say something awful, like about whatever you, I don't know. It's very, very few. Most people are very, very sweet, very nice. Um, and um, I, I, I haven't had anybody. So we actually have one on here right now that I don't have any moderators that caught it. Will R, 2007. Well, look at this little stitch class. I love how the poop and yes, house poop and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to, let me find out. Oh, <laughs> You know, just somebody, that's all they have to do. They're bored and they don't have anything yeah. else to do. So um, show and tell knitting podcast said, question, what is left for you to learn in knitting? Are there any techniques that you still haven't tried? There are some te techniques I haven't tried. And really mostly what I want to do is perfect what I do know. I don't know. There's some techniques I've tried that I don't like. Like I yep. really don't like twined knitting. I just don't enjoy yeah. doing twined knitting. So I don't pursue that. Um, if I enjoyed doing it, I would learn more about it. Um, I just, you know, in the last year, I taught myself how to do the uh, um, the jacquard-style jacquard double knitting. You know, that was fun. I really enjoyed that. Um, well, you do like brioche though, too, right? I love so I, I love double but, knitting. Yeah, I and so those are things that I'm like, eh, you know, I've tried them. I feel like I should try them to see what they are. And I really love texture knitting. Like that's my thing. I love cables. I love Bavarian uh, twisted stitch patterns. Uh, I will do some color work. 
Occasionally, um, I did a 1920s sweater this year that was in Tarsha. I hadn't done in Tarsha in years. And, um, you know, I didn't hate it. You know, I was always good at Antarsha, um, but it's a lot of ends to weave in. And, um, you know, I was happy enough to do it. I do stranded color work once in a while, but I really love texture. And that's yeah. what I grab with you. I love it all, but I don't like twined knitting. Mostly because it just tangles up your yarn, something horrible, and I can't deal with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mind the actual knitting of the twine knitting. It's what the yarn's doing that I yeah. don't care for. And I don't have a purpose for it because it never gets cold where I live. So I would never wear anything that is that uh, wind resistant like twined knitting is. Okay. Here's another question. This is Survival Builder 3.14 survival builder pie question when you have a flat pattern that you want to knit in the round do you just remove the edge stitches for my first sweater i made the decision of making an Aaron sweater swatching one now that's one way to look at it but you also have to think about stitch patterns because all the rows are going to be right side rows there aren't going to be any wrong side rows um i have actually i don't mind knitting in the round but um I, especially with care, with uh, Aaron sweaters, I prefer knitting them flat because I like those rust rows. Yeah. And also you tend to have a lot more stitches and the knitting is heavier. And so I prefer to knit the pieces separately uh, rather yeah, than to knit them in the room. I really like seaming. Once you learn how to seam, I actually enjoy it. It's uh, that it's not just the seaming process. It's preparing for seaming. It's thinking about the seaming before you even knit. Yep. For example, yep. some people you'll see, I get this question a lot in my Facebook group is um, how they, they say my seaming is terrible. Well, you look at what they're trying to seam and they work the stitch pattern right up to the very, you know, from the first stitch to yep. the last stitch, they didn't leave a salvage stitch for seaming. And so there's nowhere to seam. And that makes it really difficult. And then your seam, of course, doesn't look very good either. So it's not really very rewarding. But if you plan for seaming from the beginning, your seams look gorgeous. And it's very rewarding and addicting. I love to seam. Yeah, I for me, there's always that, like, I plan I'm going to do the seams. I know I'm going to like the result better. And, and I don't mind seaming at all. Um, it's the, oh, it's not knitting though. You know, it's, it's, it's doing something that's not knitting. But once I get started, I just get in this kind of Zen thing. And I'm usually so happy, like you said, with the way it's coming together. I just get so pleased with the result that I don't mind it as I'm doing it. If it's something like a blanket where you have a lot of seaming, then I will set myself up as like little mini projects. So I'm going to knit, I'm going to seam this strip together. I'm going to seam that strip together. And then I'm going to do some other thing for a while because that can uh, take a long time. But I, yeah, I don't mind seaming. And I like blocking too. I also like blocking sweaters, but I have it down to a pat. And you'll, you'll even hear, <coughs> knit along that I'm participating in just a second. Someone asked about how superwash gets out of control. Well, my superwash doesn't get out of control because I knit a gauge swatch and I block it first. So I know what to expect from the fabric. And I don't knit a four inch by four inch gauge swatch. I knit big, you guys have all seen my gauge swatches. Here's an example. It's dark yarn, but I knit big gauge swatches. If I'm gonna knit, this is superwash wool. So, and then I, this one hasn't been blocked. I did a series of three on this was an experiment. But I know what the fabric's going to do when it's wet and when it's blocked. So I, you know, I'm prepared for that, and and I take that into consideration. So when I block my sweater, if it's super wash wool, it doesn't go all out of control. Also, I have I have videos on how to block your sweater. I plan it out on my blocking board, where the from my schematic, I put pins in the pertinent places. Uh, so that my sweater piece is going to fit what I planned it to fit. And I mark it out on my blocking board. Then I block my sweater piece. I fold it up very carefully. I block it while it's folded. I bring it out. I get the excess water out. And then I unfold it carefully onto my blocking board to fit exactly in where the pins are. 
and it comes out perfect every time. Does your blocking board have a grid on it? Nope. Or nope. It's just oh, see, I have I have like an old quilter's ironing pad that has a grid on it. Yeah. And so, but with superwash, yeah, you keep everything all together. Keep it controlled. You under, yeah. Yeah. Under and then and then you bring it out. Just you know, I bring it out to you know the grid lines, and I know where. And then as it dries, it'll. It'll yes. stay in there. And you can Because even yeah. other wool will, will, will this, stretch to Let me thumb. get the other two swatches. <coughs> well, let me see. Where's the third one? The third one is, is misplaced. But so there's this one is unblocked. So you can see it's the curling. This one's been blocked. And I did this like several, quite a few years ago. This is the blocked one. I made three swatches. Left this one unblocked. One of them, I, when it was wet, I stretched it as far as it would go in every direction and pinned it out, stretched as far as it would go. The other one, I just pinned it to the shape that it wanted to be. Over time, and it took about three weeks, the one that was stretched out of shape is exactly the same size as this one now. So this tells you, you cannot block a sweater to fit. If the sweater is too small, you cannot block it to bigger. It, yes, it'll be bigger when you first take the pins out of it, but in about three weeks, it's going to be the size that it wanted to be. And unless you want to reblock it every couple of weeks, you know, so you need to block, you need to knit the sweater to fit. You need to make appropriate size gauge swatches to start out with and block them. And after I block them, I actually carry them around with me in my purse. I take them all over and I feel them all the time and I play with them. And then I measure the gauge. The fabric has been manipulated. It's had plenty of time to go to the shape that it wants to be, that it's going to stay when it's a sweater. Then I measure the gauge. So I don't make my swatch immediately before I'm going to knit my sweater. And because I'm a knitting addict, I admit it, I'm addicted to knitting. I make my swatch in the middle of the prior project. So I have two sweaters going right now. I'll, I'll have a swatch going pretty soon for the next one so that my swatch is made way in advance. I've had plenty of time to carry it around, manipulate it, play with the swatch. And then when I'm ready to start knitting, that's when I take the gauge. My sweaters fit all the time. They all come out the way I want them to. So someone else asked here, would you talk about your editing process in your software? Are you talking about the, are you, this is uh, Margaret Bramble. Are you asking about the Final Cut Pro software? Or are you talking about software for editing a knitting pattern? I'm assuming you're talking about videos. Um, Roxanne and I both use the same software and we have two different experiences with it. My experience when I got it, I, have one Apple store near me and I, my town is a good size but it's not a big town so you can go down there and get one-on-one -on -one attention pretty easily so I went down and I took I actually carried my desktop computer down there with me and I have all my videos and stuff and this is why I first got this software and I asked them to show me how to do it so they didn't have any classes coming up on that topic you know how they do the free classes at the Apple store so they made classes for me and nobody else went to them. It was just me. So it was, it was one-on-one -on -one education and I went over and over and over and I would learn something. I would go home and try it. And then I'd come back and learn some more, go home and try it until I feel pretty comfortable with the software. Roxanne says she went to YouTube videos to learn how to use it. And they're not teaching you about how to make knitting videos. No, yeah. Well, I I go to you. I go to those kind of tutorials if there's something specific that I'm trying to do. Like, how do I do this specific thing? Um, I think to learn Final Cut Pro, um, I I don't know even how I I just started doing it. My husband, as like I said, has some audio and video background, so he used to do like community television back in the. Uh, late 80s early 90s before I met him so he's done he knows a lot about video to begin with and so he probably helped me a little bit but I also have a background in IT I used to when I worked in the corporate world was um, 
did what's called end user support. So we were doing all of the software evaluations and the training and installing computers and helping people. So to some extent, I have just an affinity for software. And so it's like, okay, I can do the, just the basic editing. Now, how do I do this effect or that effect? And so I'm a lot more comfortable now but a lot of it is just the vocabulary. Like, how do I even search for what it is I'm trying to do? Like, I don't have the vocabulary I for it. I don't know what to call it yet. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, I don't know. My, my, the sun is coming into my window. I'm going to try to. Okay. These there we go. Said, what about sticking? I like sticking. Um, once I learned how to do it, and I learned most of what I learned about sticking from Janine Bages, who has the Joy of Color book, and um, she does specifically, I was looking for the book, it's right here somewhere, but I don't see it at the moment. Um, she does specifically, all she does is fair owl knitting. Um, I learned how to um, spit splice the yarns in the steak. So I don't have ever have any ends and I don't, you know, I don't have ends hanging out while I'm knitting, you know, so it looks tidy right from the get go. Um, I learned how to crochet the edges of the steak before I cut it to crochet and force it before I cut it. Um, I, so I like sticking and I, I'll even stick. I, I don't have a, my yellow sweater in here, but my yellow yoke sweater has stranded knitting just in the yoke and the rest of it's just plain yellow. I stick the whole front of that. So it's not even stranded knitting. I sticked it worked just fine. And that is super wash wool in fingering weight. It's, it's Ella Ray and steaked just fine. It's still holding just fine because I did that crochet reinforcement before I cut it. And once you pick up the stitches along where you're going to pick up for your button band, it automatically forces that fabric to the back like a facing and it looks fine. It looks fine. Yeah, I have learned to steak. I've taken classes on it and done it in different ways. But I don't, you know, with the strand of color work that I did prior to the master hand knitting program was usually flat or or it would be in the round and then they would have you do a flat up up here. So I never for those uh, strand of color work things that I did with like when my kids were little never had to steak. So I've learned to do it. But again, because I'm so much i love texture so much i um it's not your forte it's not what you want to do yeah it's not right. yeah i and i keep thinking oh i should really come up with a strand of color work project to actually officially do it but i just keep finding other other things i want to do so right no there are i so many things I, to do and it's like a, the big ocean out there of knowledge that you can still gain and the never, notion never gets smaller it's like there's always more to learn that's what i love about knitting it's never boring for me. I'm constantly learning something new. Social Sur Survival Builder Pi says, comment, this is in a very bulky weight yarn, so I'm afraid that my sweater seams will be bulky. The, the seams will be the same weight as the sweater. It, and it seems like they would be, you know, but they're going to fit in with the overall weight of the sweater. They won't stand out. If you do them properly, um, they should be fine. <laughs> And you could do, if it's stock and out, you could do a half stitch. Right, use a half stitch if your edge stitches look nice. Yeah, yeah. If edge stitches don't look nice, that makes them look worse. So yeah. um, let's see. A Anita Mann says, what do you think of the modification of SSK where the second slip stitch is slipped for a while? That is so stupid. Oh, my God. That is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I'm sorry if I'm insulting anybody, but it's... Um, you slip the first stitch as if to knit, slip the second stitch purlwise, put them both back on the left needle and knit them through the back. Why do you have to slip that second stitch? Yeah, you don't. You know, you slip the first stitch knitwise, put it back on the left needle and knit those two stitches through the back. It's like, that's when I first saw somebody do that, I thought, oh my God. <laughs> they don't get it. They don't understand. Yeah, and I, but the thing is, I don't even like having that bottom stitch twisted. No, I, um, I do the traditional SSK and I, I think we have been we've been trained by the master hand and yeah. broker. We've been but trained I, by Arenda. I tried it and I 
people go, oh, it looks better. Maybe it looks better for them. For me, the twisted stitch raises the, the surface up a little bit. And for me, I feel like it looks more noticeable. I will use that tech knitter, like a version of a thing that has extra twists in it. If I'm doing, in a very specific situations, I will use a different sort of twisted left-leaning decrease. Right. Um, but it's got to be you know, very You could just do an SSP on the previous row if you're knitting flat in the same spot, just to be one row lower or one row higher. And the SSPs look really, really good compared to SSKs. And oh, yeah, that, I agree. I used to do that. Same direction. I have just be flat. off by one row, which it will not be noticeable if you're knitting flat. You can't do that if you're knitting in the round. Sally yeah. Peaches said, do you block acrylic yarn? I've never knit anything out of acrylic yarn, so I can't really? do that. You've never knit anything acrylic? Nope. Um, um, I have for like my kids when they were little babies and my niece and nephew when they were little babies. I just throw it in the wash. I mean, that's you, you're supposed to treat it the way you would treat it if you were, you know, going to be washing the finished item. I just throw it in the wash. So, so 37 Vega Lira. <laughs> Add, I just machine washed my superwash merino sweater and dried it. I used a garment bag to wash and took it out to dry in rest of laundry. Came out great. That's okay. After I do that much work, I'm afraid to throw anything in the. I don't put my socks in the washer and dryer. I oh, I do. <laughs> I don't put them in the dryer. I put them in the washer. I probably put them in the dryer once a winter. When they, I feel like they've just gotten more and more stretched out from being super wash and they're not quite, they're just feeling baggy and I'll just, because they, I feel like they pick up too much lint, you know, in the dryer. They, I just hang them on a lingerie rack, but yeah, I don't put, I don't put sweaters in the, in the wash and dryer. And not after that much work. <laughs> no. Especially since some super wash doesn't, isn't permanent. It seems like. Uh, so Joanne I, Young said, question, does Janine go into detail for steaking? I'd have to look in her book, but I have some really good videos on steaking. If you want to look at my videos, I have some, the, my yellow sweater, I made a video of it when I steaked it. So let's see if there's any more question. Carol Brasino, question. After blocking a cotton sweater, have you experienced it stretch? Years ago, I knitted a cotton sweater and over time it became a dress. Cotton is heavy and it will stretch. And it has no yeah. recoil like wool does. Wool has a normal recoil, so like elbows don't stretch out, you know, or uh, if you made pants, the knees wouldn't stretch out because the wool has spring to it. It recoils. That's why well, you can stretch it and it pops right back. Cotton doesn't do that. It's just like, remember jeans? Remember Levi's? Uh, before they were uh, pre-washed and you'd buy them a size or two too big because you knew they were going to uh, shrink in the washer and dryer. This might be before Roxanne's time. Uh, <laughs> and so, and then as you wore them, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you threw them in the washer and dryer and they shrunk down again. That's just the nature of cotton. So cotton is something that I don't use a lot. You might use more because you live in a hot climate. Um, but I do find that I will put something like that in the dryer until it's just damp because it, it when it's washed, even it, it wants to, grow, you know, it, it easily stretches out. So I tend to um, um do, I do put cotton things in the dryer for a little while until they're just damp and then I can finish letting them dry. This is somebody asked about my steaking video. So I'm going to show it here what it looks like. Um, let me see if I can share this on my screen. Share screen. Where's my screen options? Oh, that's not it. Okay, so this is, whoops, it's not going to work. 
Okay, it's called um, Reinforcing and Cutting a Steak. And let me go back to my source. I lost my scenes. Where's my scenes? Uh oh. I did something. Be patient, please. Scenes. <laughs> Share screen. Camera. Okay, there we are. Sorry. I'm learning all the time, and this is live, so there you go. So that was the answer to that. It's called, um, what did I say it was called? I forgot already. But if you just put Suzanne Bryan sticking, you can Google that. It'll pop up with any of the other sticking videos that I have. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about. You know, both Roxanne and I have a lot of videos. And if you're trying to look for something specific, I think the easiest thing is to use your search browser. If you use Google, use that or DuckDuckGo or whatever it is you use for your browser. Just type what you're looking for in the browser. Put Roxanne Richardson and uh, cables or whatever you're looking for. And any videos that she's tagged with cables will pop up and you can look and see what it is. Same with me. If you want to learn steaks, you put Suzanne Bryan steaks and it'll pop right up. And then I have a lot of playlists too that I try to group things together like, you know, the sock videos or even I have tons of sock videos, but I have one that's got all my sock videos and I have another that's sock heels and sock toes. And then I have increasing and decreasing or, you know, all of casting on or binding off. And so right. kind of I depends on the topic. too, but still people have a hard time finding them. Uh, yeah, it's not, especially when you have that many videos, it's, it's hard. I can't even remember sometimes like, did I do a video on that? I, know, I, know. I have to go search in my own thing to see if I have one. So Wolf Graph, you know, people are commenting about me saying that I don't knit with acrylic yarn. I don't knit with acrylic yarn because when I was a little kid, my mom always taught me to wear natural fibers and that I've spent my whole life doing that because my mother, my dad worked in the oil industry and my mother really believed that we should not wear chemical byproducts next to our skin. And so that is why it's not because I'm a yarn snob. It's because the way I was raised and what my mother taught me that I don't use. I don't buy acrylic clothing either. Um, it's just, you know, like some people are vegetarians and some people are carnivores and some people are om omnivores. I like to use natural fibers and I, I, all my clothing is natural fiber. This is cotton. So um, I'm not down against acrylic. I'm not, I'm not being that way. So I, but I can't answer questions about acrylic because I don't use it. Yeah. And for me, it's, uh, it's a, these days it's a deliberate choice to use something that has acrylic in it. Um, thinking about the recipient or, or, and how they're likely to take care of it. But when I learned to knit, I would go to a yarn shop, I'd pick out a pattern that was from a yarn company, and I would use the yarn that they called for. And so if it was a ba and I was knitting a lot of baby items early on, because they had a niece and nephew, and then I had little kids, and it was usually acrylic yarn. So that's the majority of things that I have knit that are acrylic have been uh, baby related. And but nowadays, like I have a grand nephew, he got he got, he got a little grandpa sweater with made from from hand painted wool because I wanted to do that, but that's not going to be realistic for to, for some people. So, um. well, Susan Day has a question for you, Rock. She says, "Where do you find the early knitting books that you collect?" Oh, I have a lot of uh, vintage books. So I actually talked about this in my Casual Friday video yesterday. Um, a lot of times you can get digitized books, especially if they're from before the 1920s, because then the copyright isn't an issue. So there are a lot of 19th century digitized manuals. If you're interested in just reading through those to see what things were like for 20th century, um, I use if I want an actual physical copy. Um, I'll use Abe books and I just go in and I, as a keyword, I'll use knitting 
or knitting manual. And then you can choose if you want it used. You can you can do an advanced search and do time frame. Sometimes that's a problem if you're looking around 1900 because I think some people putting knitting books in, they they may not put a time frame in. There may be a default of 1900, and so you'll see these really modern books. That's a little frustrating. Um, then there are people who sell vintage patterns, like they collect them and you can just buy them from their website. Or if they have cleared the copyright, they might sell a PDF or even get them, you can get them free sometimes. Um, and then some people do reproduction books. I think it took me a couple of months to kind of figure out how to search for that. Any Anytime I'm interested in a new topic, I have a hard time, you know, figuring out what, where, where do I need to look or how do I need to search for it? It takes a little time to kind of figure that out. Um, just sometimes, like anything, it, just like anything, there's a learning curve. Yep. And so, like for World War One era, there are museums even around the world that have, especially things knit for soldiers, that they'll, they'll have those pattern books in their museum digitized collections. In Australia, they have this whole national uh, uh, periodicals and newspapers have been digitized, and there were tons of knitting patterns in magazines and newspapers. So it just kind of depends on on what you're looking for if you want hard copy or not. Um, the I was looking for mid-century knitting manuals and not being able to figure out how to find those like a hard copy and it was somebody in the all things vintage group mentioned some book that had been published in the UK and I like I had a title and then I had an author name and then I found out they those two women published like eight books in the 1940s and so once I knew what those were then I went on to eight books and I looked to, you know, who was selling those. Um, so that's the thing is like, where, where, where's the, the one piece of information that you need in order to find those. So just like, um, um, when just knitting books in general, like most of the, my knitting library are reference books. Yep. And, uh, sometimes I'll buy a book that has patterns in it. If there's some information in it that is not in any of my reference books. If there's something yep. new or interesting in there, then I'll buy that book, even though it's a pattern book. Um, but I also read them and I read the bibliography in the back. That's where oh. you're going to learn about a lot of other books and sources of knitting information. It's one of the things that I really like oh. about Cast On Magazine and some articles in Interweave Knits, not all of them, is if they list a bibliography for the sources, the resources that they, for their article, I will go and I will look at all those resources because when you're reading the article, you're just getting that person's interpretation of what they read in the resources. I may gain some different information from the resources. That's one of the ways that I found out that David Zinnikus wrote an article about double knit buttonholes, you know, and it's like, the only way I found out about it was because it was listed as a reference to a reference to a reference when I'm going back and reading those. And I've learned a lot of stuff that way. It's just normal research. It's, it's because my background in the medical field, I'm used to doing research. So I just automatically go to that level of research. And that's how I learn. Yeah, I I am finding these uh, old books really interesting. I that's the first thing I I do is I look in their reference section if there is one in the knitting book to see how they are saying to do things and how are they saying to cast on, how are they saying to increase, how are they saying to if they ever do, they rarely do tell you how to seam. So it's but it's really given me an insight into how the techniques that we use today, how they've kind of evolved. And the reason why some people still have these holdover techniques that they do that they were taught, like why were they taught that? Oh, it's because the reason they were taught to, to slip the first stitch of every row is because they were doing back stitch to seam and it makes it a lot easier to line things up. You know, they they did, they weren't using the same seaming technique that we're using today. And But yet that, that habit to you have to slip the first stitch of every row was ingrained in them for generations. So, mm -hmm. yeah, 
And and so and also you have to realize that uh, knitting patterns weren't always written down, or what was written down was minimal compared to what we have now because people knew how to knit. They knew the basics of garment construction because they started making them when they were very small. So the information that was written down was a different type of information. It might have been a stitch pattern or, or something different about that garment that they needed to know. So, you know, just even the history of, of written, not books about knitting, but patterns like came out in magazines and such like that. That's an interesting topic too, you know, going back and seeing how pattern writing evolved. Um, this is 37 Vega Lira. She says, question for Roxanne, are there Art Deco type knitting patterns? I love the Art Deco style. Well, I think things from the 1920s, um, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how you would define Art Deco clothing, but the 1920s has some really interesting patterns. Um, and there are, I love I love the 1920s fashion. The problem is that like many vintage or all vintage patterns before about 1950, they were in one size and the fashion was to have a boyish figure. So they were using shapewear to smash themselves down. And that it's, the, the look isn't going to be the same in a lot of cases, those really long straight silhouettes um with no boobs and no hips uh it's a little hard to pull <laughs> a little hard to pull off now that chanel um, had better with the bow on the front the intarsia bow i would say that was art deco was that else elsa Schiaparelli? No, chanel. the chanel Something. sweater i didn't think it was chanel i thought it was Schiaparelli or oh, elsa no. um let me see I have my Richard book. I think it's in here because it was in the 1920s. Yeah, well, she she was using um, some machine that she was using uh, wool jersey during World War One because she couldn't get woven fabrics for because they were being used for soldiers' uniforms. So she kind of brought sweaters into the more just regular casual wear instead of being athletic garments. But I thought that was Elsa uh, something or other. So are you talking about the one where they use that technique where they were trapping the, uh, the, the black and white all the way around? Okay, but is that is that Chanel? Yes, Gabriel oh, Chanel. Why did I think that was? Um, That's in Tarja. It's in Tarja. Oh, well, I think it's that you can see. I think it's that thing. Um, who is it? Uh, Schoolhouse it's, Press. It's, well, it's it's Gabriel, Gabriella, Ch Chanel, and Elsa Schiaparelli. That's the name that I was yes, but trying it's, to. It's Chanel that designed the sweater. Okay. Um, you know, it says it's Shia Pirelli's that with the white collar. And that was, um, in 1927. Yeah. So there's some really interesting sort of geometric, um, uh, shapes and things. There are some, um, UK websites that have some patterns for those. So the twenties just get trickier because of copyright laws, but um, all things, the all things vintage group on Ravelry is a good resource for where can I find patterns for this decade. And then, and I think antique pattern library, um, you can look at things by decade and, uh, and there, there are other vintage uh, websites too, where you can look at things by decade, and you can get um, styles. But the 1920s had, is when the sweaters got really interesting, and the construction methods got a lot more sophisticated in some cases as well. When the fair isle became positive, popular too, it's around that time, and yokes. Yep. Yep. 
But they had a lot of these dressmaker techniques where they were doing armhole shaping differently in the front than the back. I mean, some really like much more sophisticated even than we would tend to do and, today. And answers. And I think we're going to uh, call it quits here shortly because we've been on here for an hour and a half already. Uh, okay. Anne says, question, what are the differences between mattress stitch and back stitch seams? It's two completely different ways. Yeah. Mattress stitch, the yarn is going like this in the end. Back stitch, it's going like this. You use a lot more yarn in the seam to do a back stitch than you do um, doing a mattress stitch. Yeah, back stitch, it's the same back stitch that you would use in regular sewing, like if you had woven fabric. So they were using the same techniques for seaming that they used regardless of the type of fabric back then. And mattress stitch literally goes through the loops of one stitch then the next from side to side. So it's snaking up, and it actually is one long straight strand if you pull it yeah, tight. And you do it from the right side of the work with the two pieces lying uh, edge to edge flat, where back stitch you have the right sides facing, um, and they're... Just like sewing. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to call it quits. Um, if you are one of my subscribers, feel free to go over to Roxanne's um, channel um and or her youtube channel and subscribe and if you're one of her subscribers you haven't subscribed to my channel come on over and subscribe to my channel i think you'll get good information from both of us and um we'll do this again sometime so have yeah, a good afternoon fun. good afternoon and Hi, happy knitting you're welcome thanks for being here yep I'll bring it to an end bye everyone